Gracious God, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I just implore you, I beseech you, in behalf of this dear brother who has been a valuable messenger in equipping saints for decades, I pray, Heavenly Father, that once again you would pour out the blessing through him. Father, I pray for a clear and clean channel that might be used by you for your glory as we as we worship together in this place again today. Bless him as he speaks to us about encountering Christ and the fellowship of the saints. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would quicken his tongue. May it not be dull in any sense that you would heal his body that, that has been uh, afflicted to some degree this past several days and just use him as a vessel for your praise and for your glory. Bless us each one as we listen to this message, as we take it in, as we drink of the fountain. May we worship thee, O Father, in spirit and in truth during this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. It is certainly a great blessing to greet you in Jesus' name this morning, and we welcome all of you here. It has been a very humbling experience for us during this weekend to be together, and I realize that all of you were here through all the sessions, but the Lord has been working here among us. Now they say the title of this message is Encountering Christ in the Fellowship of the Saints. I just want to call attention to the fact that you have a folder, a program, in the beginning of that program, it says KFW, and do you know what the letter F stands for in those three initials? And then I'd like to do something with that word fellowship, Kingdom Fellowship Weekend. As for as much as we appreciate the fellowship we have here, as much as we appreciate the blessing of being together in this way, for as valuable as this is to us to be here, for the equipment that God puts into our hearts because we're together here. Our goal is this year, in Kingdom Fellowship Weekend, that we take that F and take it back home. There is where fellowship is truly tried. There is where fellowship is truly tested. There's where we find out if our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. It is back home. There's a tremendous amount in my life that I can hide from you on a weekend. I don't hide it from my brothers and sisters at home. I don't want to hide it from my brothers and sisters at home. In fact, we only have fellowship one with another to the extent that we don't hide it. So I want to make that point at the very beginning here. What we're experiencing here, hearing here, what God is filling our hearts with here, we must take back home to our local assemblies. And there we must live it. Now, <clears throat> A good sermon is supposed to have three points in it. Mine does not. I only have one point. I'm going to try to get this point across. You won't have to listen very long this morning until you'll find out what that point is if you're extremely discerning. I will not ask you to raise your hand as soon as it dawns on you what this point is. But if you're paying attention, you will get it. And then throughout the rest of the time we're together here, we will try to reinforce it. But there's only one point this morning. Encountering Christ in the fellowship of the saints. If you would desire to meet Christ today, where would you go to find him? If you for 12 years would have wasted all of your substance for an embarrassing medical problem that did not allow you to mingle with the public. 
Where would you expect to find Christ so that you could reach up and touch the hem of his garment? Where would you go to find that? How many of you know where we are by now? Did you figure it out yet? You know where we are, don't you, Brother Joel? You, you follow me here. If you would desire to present your smoke child to Christ, where would you go to do that? If you were burdened with sin and hoped to find cleansing and forgiveness, where would you expect to find Christ? You will not find him in Simon the Pharisee's house. You can't go in that door and kneel down at someone's feet. He will not be there. But where would you go? If you would be of little stature, would you climb a sycamore tree in order to be able to see Jesus? Where can Christ be found? And now I'll make a first point. <laughs> Someone told me this morning, yeah, we, we have a little house church. Now, I didn't say it to the dear brother, but I, I thought it. There was a time when this Bible was being written, that's all they had was house churches. That is, they had house meetings, and we have meeting houses. But they had house meetings. And yet, as biblical as it is to have house meetings, many of those house meetings do not work. They are of short duration. And people find themselves migrating from house meeting to house meeting. And after a time of disillusionment, they, they, they make an interesting decision. They decide to start their own and then invite people to their version. And usually the results are about the same. And I will tell you why there's difficulty there. The reason why there's difficulty is because the purpose for which we've done it the purpose for which we're migrating and checking it out and the moving van goes from place to place. There's nothing wrong with moving. It's because I'm trying to find something or I'm trying to get away from something. But it's not our heart's desire and effort. It's not the purpose and as Brother John said, our passion to be sure that anyone ever runs into us, ever encounters us, ever comes in among us, finds one thing when they get there. The greatest need that they have is to find Christ in that fellowship of the saints. And that is where the world should encounter Christ. And that's where I need to encounter Christ. Because though the lady was, is burdened with her physical maladies, or though there are sins that she cannot take care of in her life, and she brings an alabaster box and brings tears and hair in order to worship him. In many, many ways, I'm the same way. In an assembly of God's people, I must find Christ there. I can't make it without it. And that is where Christ is found. He is encountered in the fellowship of the saints. Now we should certainly support that with scripture. This is not the text this morning, but I'm going to turn to several verses. This is still introduction, but in Matthew 18. This is Jesus speaking here. I'll read two verses, 19 and 20. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, would someone like to finish that verse? 
There am I. And so if someone's looking for where to encounter Christ, that, that's where he is. And then the question is, what should be the nature of that fellowship so that he is there in the midst and anyone that comes would discover that? 1 Corinthians 14, another text that indicates this again very, very clearly and jumping in the middle of a sentence here, if you don't mind me doing that, verse 23, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in of those that are unlearned and or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? But of all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down in his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. These are powerful words from Scripture. And tells you that Christ will be found there. Ephesians chapter 3, these again beautiful words. Verses 16 through 21 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with all might by his spirit and the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The church is the body of Christ. The church is his life, his power, his love, and his healing. The church is the place of his victory, of his forgiveness, his peace, his fullness are found in the church of Jesus Christ. That was Ephesians 3. This is Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God onto a perfect man. This is plural. This is corporate. This is your assembly. This is your fellowship. This is where you're committed. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what the congregation is. That's what the church is. That's what the local assembly is. So we were preaching there, and someone had this great big, this great big beautiful whiteboard there that you could draw on and write all kinds of notes. And there was an artist in the audience, so I asked him to come up front here and draw a, 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 a rather rapid version there of the Statue of Liberty. And so that was done. And, we, he, and he did a very, very good job doing that. In the few moments that he did, he quickly drew that up there. He's, a, he's, he's an artist. And just there, there all of a sudden, the Statue of Liberty appeared in front of us. And so now, I just use that illustration to illustrate this verse. And so here's this assembly of saints, and here's the edifying the body of Christ. Here's the one soul ministry to another one. Here is the love flowing. Here is life moving from heart to heart. And something strange is happening. This whole thing is growing as this is happening. This thing is growing. And it's not growing because 25 more moving vans moved in the community in the past year. This, this thing is growing. What is happening? This image is being perfected. And, and, and we have this glorious representation. We have this glorious presence of Christ in the midst. And we grow up to this stature. We grow up to this fullness. We, we grow up to this representation. We grow up into, into the point where we are here in this world ministering the way Christ ministered and doing for people what Christ did for people. And this is the local assembly. This is what the church is for. And there's no other place to get this done. There's no other place that meets this need. There's no other place to go. To find the image of him that filleth all things. And his glory fills the house. And so these scriptures find their greatest fulfillment in that local assembly, that local gathering together of God's people, the church of Jesus Christ, wherever that happens to be in the culture, community, in isolation, wherever it is, 
where it finds itself. And that's why I think the competition between churches is such a foolish thing. That's why I am better than you are is such a terrible attitude. That's why me needing to stand in the pulpit and and condemn other groups who do not do it like we do it seems like such an awful violation of the glory that our Lord is worthy of. It just seems like something terrible is happening. When I need to do that, because we have the greatest opportunity in all the world to let this stature and fullness in, in Christ Jesus grow into an image of holiness unto our Lord, a testimony of his presence among us. And I know we don't all do it the same way. Someone has called my attention this weekend to the tremendous variety of people that are gathered here. I know that everyone that's here is welcome to be here. You're here because we want you to be here. You're all welcome here. If each of us would concentrate on this one thing, if anyone in our communities, if any one of our neighbors, if anyone that's driving on the highway If anyone who becomes aware that there's a little church over here, if anyone that would drive past would discover that there's a little group of God's people gathered together, and they would have one of the greatest needs in their life that uh, that you've ever found in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, and they would would choose to come to your assembly, they'd get out of their vehicle and then come into your meeting house and say, I I hope that here could happen. I I hope that here, I'd be a joy if here, and they don't know what to expect. If you would think of gathering together with that in mind, we represent the Christ of the gospel in this community where we are. What kind of a powerful testimony, what kind of word for the Lord, what kind of work a witness would go out from your place? That would be spread abroad. If you ever need to meet Christ, go over there. You'll find it there. And I don't have to go any further before my heart begins to burn. I don't have to go any further before I see great needs in our congregation at home, the things we need to improve too. So this stature can grow. So men can find this kind of help. We tend to think of church too often as a gathering in a building. As in this expression, for example, and just where do you go to church? That question was asked many, many times since Friday afternoon on this campus? That's an interesting question, and we understand what you mean when you ask that question. We tend to think of Sunday school, with which no one in the book of Acts ever thought about. They didn't know that that existed. We might think of bringing a Bible and a hymn book along with us, or maybe there's one in Iraq at the church where you go. We might even think of this. Well, let's see, whose turn is it to preach on Sunday? These are things we think about when we think of church. But the church is the embodiment of Christ. As we have fellowship one with another, we have fellowship with Christ. Listen to this very, very well-known verse. Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Does the gathering of saints where I assemble reflect the person of Jesus Christ? That's the only place to find him. And, you know, I realize that a person could get on their knees any place at all and have an encounter with Jesus by faith. I know the person can find a Bible someplace they never had one, read in a Bible that has happened in all kinds of interesting ways throughout history. The prisoner in Vietnam during the war that had to clean 
the, the, the latrines, the latrines in the prison camp. And he found these papers that were used there. They were soiled with because they were used for uh, there in the toilets. And he saw writing on those papers, and he tried to clean the dirty away so he could read what was on those pages. And he did not know what he was reading, but he was reading pages of a Bible. Someone were tearing pages out of a Bible to use for that. And he started collecting these papers. And when his week was up and he was just put, not supposed to clean it anymore and somebody else could do it, he asked his prison responsible person there if he could keep on doing that for a while longer to get more papers. A person can find Christ that way. And many have. But there's something unique about finding saints gathered together where there's love flowing, where there's deep appreciation, where there's a humble spirit towards one another. There's a beautiful thing happening when someone notices, someone cares, someone asks, someone invites, someone offers a word of hope. A beautiful thing happens. And the needs, no matter how serious they are, and how crippling and debilitating they might be, can be brought into this assembly. And God uses those brothers and sisters there to minister to my heart, to my needs. And as you hear those words this morning, I wonder if your heart burns. Do you desire that in your life? I'd say, is that missing in your life? You might meet with a group of 300 All alone. You're all alone. Why are you all alone? It's a terrible thing to be alone. You see, the church was birthed by the twin dynamics, two things happening, happening together that brought the church into existence. We have the united prayer of the few chosen ones, the few gathered ones. We have that united prayer. And then into that united prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit descended. I'll just read that for you there in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. They're in an upper room here, it says in verse 13. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Chapter 2, verse 1 says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, and set on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the church was birthed here. And we have a unique and beautiful result of that recorded in verses 42 through 47. And some of you may not have been here when this passage has several times been read in this assembly. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their bread with gladness and signals of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we have this beautiful word fellowship here in verse 42. And the uh, some of you might know Spanish here in this audience. I just thought I would tell you that the difference between the Spanish version of verse 42 here and this that I just read is this, that our Spanish Bible says, and they all continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship one with another. That's in Spanish, it's not in English. And in breaking of bread and in prayers, fellowship one with another, fellowship with the saints. 
Fellowship is a distinctly New Testament word. Fellowship is dynamic. Dynamic means that something is happening. There's a function. Something is taking place. When there's fellowship, it's not just the two people are together. It's just not the one is here and one is here. That if there's fellowship, something is going on between those two people. There, there's an activity. There's action. That's why I use the word dynamic. There's power here. There's something that's functioning. Life is flowing. I, I will show you a little word picture of this in, in Mark chapter 5. And some of you might not have Bibles, but if you don't, I'll read it to you. But this lady, I referred to her in the introduction. She had an issue of blood for 12 years. I think it was 12 years. Yes, it says 12 years in verse 25. But I wanted to read verse 30. And verse 30 comes to us after she already touched him and she's worked her way through that crowd and come up from behind. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. This is an amazing thought that she had. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And I want you to notice verse 30. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? The disciples thought it was a, an unusual and, and a, a wrong kind of question to ask. But Jesus felt something going out from him. The Spanish Bible says he felt power going out from him. And that's fellowship. And so Brother Leonard asked us to stand and shake the hand and, and wish a blessing. And when we're having true fellowship with one another, something is flowing. Something is happening. Something's happening to my life and something is happening to your life. It's not just a static experience. It's not just a social club. It, it's not just a, 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 a toast as we snap the edges of the glasses together over the top of the table. It's not just a cafecito. It's not a snack. There's fellowship. And that means that something's happening from one person to another person. <laughs> that means the cords that are broken can vibrate once more. It means that something that is ruined and depressed and lonely and rejected finds strength anew and courage to try to start over again. This happens time and again in our services. This happens in ways we know nothing about. But virtue is flowing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, worship service. It's flowing in the, in the, between the aisles after the service. We usually have three church services every Sunday morning in our congregation. Usually people meet out in the Behind, we don't have a foyer in our building. It's just a little tiny room. But there's a little bit of a porch out there, and it rains a lot in Costa Rica, so you have to have a room, to, a, a roof, because it's a lot of rain. We get 220 inches a year where we live. So the first service is out there. And everyone's so glad to meet each other. It, it may be a, be a couple days since we've seen all those people. And we, there are not very many of us, but we're all glad to be together. And after this, after a period of time, everyone goes inside the building and sits down. And then we have a second service in there. And then when that's over, we get back out there again and a third one. And I don't know how long that one's going to last. But some very, very beautiful things happen in the first service and in the third one. And, and I think sometimes some things happen in the middle service too. But something's happening between people. And and for virtue to flow from us, for power to go out from us, it takes a commitment there. And if I have some kind of resentment in my heart towards a brother that's there, some kind of jealousy, I feel somehow or another threatened by what he's doing, threatened by his gift, threatened by his contribution. If I feel that in my heart, uh, 
No, it, it will not happen. I'll miss the opportunity. I won't even become aware. And not only that, but my very nature, my very spirit being wrong as it is and prideful as it is and selfish as it is, that that person wouldn't even dare to sneak up behind and, and touch the bottom of the garment. We wouldn't feel free to do it. And, and what matter of person should we be in our assemblies? What kind of church service should we have? How should this local assembly look? So that the person with the greatest need that could possibly be stepping into that building this day could feel free. I, this, this is what I'm facing. This is what happened to me. I am a mess. I am not fit. <coughs> Just like someone said in our service just a few services back. I am not fit to be a mother. I'm an awful wife for my husband. I am a mess. Could somebody please pray for me? Could somebody help me? I am a mess. If you're not experiencing that in your church, if in your assembly somebody would not be free to say that, I'd like to ask you something. Why not? Because I will assure you, you, you have that in your church just like we have it in ours. I will assure you, those people are needed up here just like they're needed down there. That's not all. I will assure you, I'm the one that needs it. I'm the needy one. I'm the one that has to have a church like that. So I'm trying to help you understand what this means when it says encountering Christ in the fellowship of the church, in the fellowship of the saints. It's a, it's a very, very beautiful concept. concept. Virtue moves from one to another. 1 John chapter 1. Yes, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. See, Jesus was here then. He was physically here on the earth. The life was manifested that we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father has manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. How you do that? That ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, worship declared, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Brother Joe, what is that Greek tense that we have here in the word cleanseth, which means it's continually progressive action. It's aorist tense, aorist tense. How do you say that in Greek? Aorist tense. I will say this, that uh, Fellowship is always an heiress tense. That's just the way it is. Fellowship is continuous action. Fellowship is the transmission of life. Fellowship is a parallel circuit. We're all united with Christ. If you're an electrician, you know, what, you know what I mean. And when you have a parallel circuit... You can put as many light bulbs, as many whatever you want to on that circuit as you wish, and each one receives an equal amount of it. And all, all you're doing is just magnifying the effect of it. And no one loses any of the, but the, the, the potency of it. It's a parallel circuit. We're all united with Christ. 
Is it impossible? It is impossible to fellowship one with another without having fellowship with the Christ with Christ at the same time. What is this fellowship whereby we encounter Christ? Let's talk about that just a little bit. This fellowship. And, and it could be that you have the saints of God in this fellowship union with each other. And at the same time, you might have unconverted people, some neighbor, some stranger, someone who doesn't understand this thing, some needy person, who, who maybe has their fellowship with God broken for who knows whatever reason. And, and then they're observing this dynamic that's going on here. And you need to think about this as you're leading the singing. You need to think about this as you're choosing the hymn. You need to think about this as you're leading the congregation in prayer. You need to think about this as you're preparing the sermon for the Sunday morning. You need to think about this as you meet with your brother in the aisle after church service. You need to think about this. That something's happening here. And there's someone here needs to encounter Christ. Someone here is observing, is, is desiring to feel, to touch, to understand. What is this fellowship whereby we encounter Christ? Whereby the lost and the needy around us can encounter Him? Whereby the unlearned and unbelievers may come to know Him? And again, I want to remind you, as we heard on Friday night, that in this sense, and in a very true sense, this fellowship of which we speak is a is a strong evangelism power. It's an evangelism tool. Well, they tell me that this word, and, and again, Joel, would you help me one more time here? I don't know if the word is pronounced koinonia or koinonia. Koinonia. So that's the Greek word for it. Thank you, brother. And this word is not really hard to understand although I've never seen as clear a description or definition of this word in this language as I would like to have learned, but let's talk about the word participation. It comes very, very close to our English word participation, participating in something, something that we share mutually. It's something we have all received. And it's an identifying factor that brings us into oneness. Now, I'll use this illustration. Where we live up there in the mountain in Costa Rica, there are just little dairy farms up there. You can't farm this ground up there. It's too steep, and there's too much rain. No one needs a tractor to plow fields. No one needs a forage harvester to cut grain or chop silage. No such thing exists. All you need is a cow to go out there and eat, the, eat her own grass. And, and this, is, this is dairy country. It's not really good for anything else. And so cows are up there in that grass. All of our neighbors are dairy farmers. So this one little road winds its way up through these mountains and, and, and climbs higher and higher. And that little road unites everyone together. But there is something unique that identifies each one lives up there. They are dairy farmers. And so it kind of makes a, you know, an artificial little identification that brings us all together there. Uh, and dairy farming is not easy there. Sometimes it rains too much, and then the grass doesn't grow. And we don't have any silos or any hay mows. You can't bale hay when it rains 220 inches a year. The grass must grow for the cows every day. So we have this united, united factor that kind of holds us together. But in fellowship, there's something else that's a uniting factor. It's an identifying factor that just brings us all into unity with each other. And that is the fact that we've all participated in Christ. We've all participated in his sufferings. We all have met at that crucial juncture between our will and God's will. And we've met Christ there. And, and that factor does something to each one of us. And though backgrounds might be different and languages spoken are not the same, culture is vastly different, but this one unifying factor does something to, to these people that are gathered together in Jesus' name with Christ in the midst that does something between them that nothing else could do. It brings us into oneness. It is the one thing that makes us all alike. And the disciples were called Christians, first in Antioch. And this was interesting. This, 
I don't think they named themselves that. I don't think the people back in Jerusalem said, oh, interesting over at Antioch, they've got Christians over there. I believe this name came from the neighbors observing them. It, it's the means by which I seek Christ in my brother. I'll stop right there. By which I seek Christ in my brother. My brother. And think of the thoughts that are conjured up. And think of the Im image that comes to your mind. When all of a sudden you think of that one with whom there's a tension and whom there's a breach of fellowship. And there's an avoidance. And sometimes unkind words said. And you hear that person's name and someone tries to give a little word of credit for something that that person has done and they appreciate it so much and you can already stand that. That's that someone is speaking well of one with whom your own heart is not at all in agreement. And you find it somehow interesting to try to project some kind of contradictory and balancing word in there that kind of takes some of this prestigium away and, and uh, reduce this person to a little closer to the size that you think he ought to be. And, and yet, I just said, I see Christ in my brother. And I wonder how we can do that. And would you try to explain to me what's going on in our hearts that this kind of thing takes place time after time, day after day, in our local assemblies? And immediately there's love and life and peace. There's unity and there's cohesion. You know the difference between cohesion and adhesion? When there's cohesion, you don't need to put anything artificial around it to hold it together. You don't need to take adhesive tape to tape it together. And because it's cohesively bound together. The molecules hold together. And there's cohesion in the church. There's cohesion in fellowship. It's something internal. There is a union of lives. And this beautiful, beautiful word that takes us from the word common to the word communion to the word communication to the word community. These are beautiful words which mean we all participated in something similar. The company of the committed. And it means that I'm no longer alone. It means that I'm accepted and wanted. And though I cannot explain it, I am needed and included for the first time in my life. And I find out that I can do something that I've never been able to do. In this environment, it is safe for me to allow somebody to love me. It's a terrible hard thing for many of us to do. Allow someone else to love us. And this explains the agapes that were in the New Testament. Those, those love meals that they had. It explains the united prayers that there were. The willing offerings that there, we see here. The meetings and the being frequently together explains it. Why they were able to confess things one to another. Why there was forgiveness. Why there was this gift of restoration in the church and the brotherhood. Because Christ, excuse me, because what Christ did when he was here, we do now. And what he was in this world for, we are in this world for. And as the Father sent him, even now he sends us. That's why we are here. Can you imagine your church, your assembly, your local body? Being in your community where you are. In your culture or area, I don't know what you call your place where you live. But you are there because Christ is not there. But you are there. Not you individually. You corporately. You in this fellowship of the saints. You in this union with one another. And that is why this is such an important thing in Christ's heart. That's why the prayer that we prayed back to Christ this morning. The, the importance of it. It's imperative 
that we do do anything, we do not do anything to hinder the image of Christ, the power of Christ, the life of Christ in our assemblies. Who does not want to be part of a church like that? And it grows, the Bible tells us, Ephesians, a spiritual house, a holy testimony. And of the many pictures we have of this gathered brotherhood, this gathered body, one of them I've read it to you right this morning. I'll just read it again. You don't need to turn to it, but I read it in Matthew 18. It said, verse 19, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth. That word agree is such a beautiful word in our Bibles at home. De acuerdo. And it's a picture in the Greek language of a symphony. The word is, that's what the word is in Greek. It's a symphony. This church, and here, though you don't know anything at all about London Philharmonic Orchestra, though you've never heard of Sir Malcolm Sargent, you are a symphony. And there's a harmony that is so very, very beautiful. There are triads. There's the great chord coming out from this assembly. There are only two or three or ten or maybe four or five families. But there's a great chord coming out of there. A great chord is interesting. Eight tones that cover two octaves. And you take this chorus of people, 200 voices, and they sing this one chord. It, it can lift you out of your seat. If you've ever heard that great chord sung by a group of people, symphony. And there's another word in the New Testament that also just gives us a beautiful image. And imagine the people of the world being drawn to this. Imagine your children, raising your children up in this church. They turn into, they turn into young adults or youth. And they're drawn to this. They hear this symphony. And they see this tapestry. Not a string or a thread, but a woven, knitted mural where all the individual strings form this beautiful woven picture. Picture of the church. We have union there. We have something that's strongly uniting it together, knit together in love. And as we heard last night, may I borrow a beautiful phrase we were hearing last evening, fellowship is the shared communion in daily practice. And that was already read to us. I'd like to read it again from 1 Corinthians 10, just to put this image before us, verses 16 and 17. And, and Brother John was certainly right about the fact that there's more than symbolism involved here. There's something that you get if you do it that you miss if you don't. There's, there's, there's something different happens to you in the participation that is not taking place with you if you're not there. there there's something, and, and I guess I'm going to not use the word mystical, but there's something spiritual that's taking place in your life. And it's not only between you and God. It has a horizontal aspect there with other brothers and sisters. The cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. That's where the, where the word Eucharist come from. The bread which we break is not the communion of the body of Christ. For we being many are one bread and one body for we are all partakers of that one bread. That's why there's fellowship. Because we're all partakers of it. And we're strengthening fellowship every time we do it. It's just that, that knitting is stronger and tighter. That symphony is, uh, is gloriously repeated. And so I need to ask a question. Are we experiencing a Christ encounter in our local assemblies? Do we truly have fellowship one with another?
Do we meet, come face to face, come heart to heart with the virtue and power and holy life of Christ that flows from our brothers into ourselves? Do we experience that in our services? I was preaching in a state here, in the States one time, some distance from here, quite a distance from here, Pennsylvania. Brother called me and said, uh, would you have time to visit with my wife and I this afternoon if we would come over there? And they were living in another state too, but they came to where I was and we met there. And he uh, sat there and, and the story he told me was something like this. Yeah, for the last two years of our lives, something serious was wrong, but we didn't know what it was. And his wife is sitting there beside him, and he's trying to find ways to explain this to me. I want you to listen real closely. He said, we discovered that for two years we had no fellowship. I thought, brother, may God bless you. Someone who had enough of Bible understanding to know that there was no fellowship there. There were meetings, there were church services, there was preaching, there was eating food together without fellowship. At first, he did not know what was, was missing. I don't know if we would recognize it if we were living without fellowship or not. Many years ago, a man was dying in his bed. He was dying of cancer. He looked up with his, with his, uh, his, his flesh was wasting away. He looked at me and said, Brother Dale, fellowship is where fellowship is, and fellowship isn't where fellowship isn't. I've not forgotten those words. One time I heard a person say these words. Yeah, you can visit with him all day, but you can't have any fellowship with him. I'm using these, some of these expressions to wake us up to something, to get us to think about something. Are we experiencing fellowship? And, and would others be able to have fellowship with me? And if they cannot have fellowship with me, then what is wrong? Where is the problem? What is blocking? What is, what is wrong? If that virtue does not flow... If someone cannot come up and touch that hymn, if someone, if that power does not go out to meet a need over here, what is hindering it? No one has fellowship with pride and selfishness. No life flows there. Come and learn of me that I am meek and lowly of heart. And you should find rest for your souls. I don't know if this is appropriate to say at a place like this, the time is rapidly going by. We have uh, in our congregations at home, we have several congregations we work with that are responsible for, try to provide oversight for. We have in our congregations at home some congregational positions, some brotherhood agreements that not all of our congregations have. We, we've, we have felt in, in some of our congregations that we would like to represent some things, identify with some things that not everyone in Costa Rica feels, but maybe it's quite as important as we feel they are. And so we're not the same in everything. We have people come to visit us from other countries where their practices and some of their focus is different from our own. I don't ever feel a need to Ever say to our congregation, I've never done it. I don't think I ever will do it. I have not, never done it until now. I've never needed to say that that's a direction we will not be going. 
I thank you, Lord, that we are not like they are. Uh, We should close the door to those people so that they don't, we just can't bring any of that in here. We have never done that. We have never held up our congregation or our expression or our identification as something that's superior to others. This is just what we have felt the Lord wanted us to do. And the people are glad to do it. And we try to teach them to be able to appreciate those who maybe see some of these things differently. We don't need to change because that they have it that way because we're thankful for what we have. And we're together on it. It's been such a blessing. And we're raising our children together. And the community, community knows what to expect of us. And we can do that with grace, with blessing, with victory, without putting down anybody else. It's tremendous freedom to be able to be in a place like this. You don't need to feel in competition with anybody. I do need to turn you to John 17 one more time. Verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest them before the foundation of the world. If I would have gone back to verse 11, we would have found that expression one more time, that they may be one at the end of the verse as we are. Five times here. Not only that they be one, not only they have some unifying factors, not only that they, maybe it's because they all speak Platteach or because they all have a, a Latin background. Not only are they one, but they are one as the Father is one with the Son. And the infusion of the divine unction upon our assemblies is equal to the unity and the one accord that we're experiencing among ourselves. This is where love comes in. Love for one another. Love cannot lose a brother, but love will reach out and gain a brother. Love will not say, Reka. It will not say, Thou fool. It will not say, Moros, where we got our word moron. It will not say to the hand, I have no need of you. It will not say, if I got along without you before I met you, I get along without you now. It will not say, you know, if, if this element would leave the congregation, we'd have peace around here. That they'd be one. Why? Because you see, when Christ was in this earth, and he met needs and preached and he talked to people and children came and he held them in their laps. He picked them up and prayed for them and blessed them. When Jesus was here, out in the storm, spoke to the winds. When Jesus was here, walked in that water and fish were caught that otherwise could not have been. When Jesus was here and he prayed to his father and spent much time with his father and did those things that pleased the father and received his words from the father and was in constant communion with his father. And there was no breach of fellowship. There was no division between them. They were perfectly joined together in one. So that his ministry would effectively represent the father and the earth. And the father could answer the prayers of the son. Because those prayers came from the Father's heart. That the Father could invest his life and power into his Son. He had no question about his glory when he poured power into the life of his Son. 
And so God could do endless things, no end to what he could do for, with his son. And Jesus is thinking of all that, but he now turns it over to us. And in this high priestly prayer, if you want to call it that, he's asking the Father, Lord, we need to teach them to live that way too. They must have that same union, that same oneness. So nothing in them would hinder their prayers being answered, the needs being met, the life being given, the, the lives being changed, the lost restored, the lonely included. We, we've got, they've got to live this way or it won't happen. Then I ask you, where does this division spirit come from? And why can't we get along? Why is my brother offended in me? What have I done? And that should not be a surprise because every one of us is so faulty. We all make many mistakes. We are somewhat aware of how easily we make mistakes. And when I learned that a brother is offended me, it should not be hard for me to say, you know, I'm going to go take care of that. I'm going to go see him. I am sorry. I don't know how often I've done that. I just know that it's my tendencies. I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to go do what I can. I know it's hard to offend love. Love is not threatened by another. Love knows no competition. Love needs no credit nor recognition. Love gives life as long as there's life to give. We learned that in John 13. He loved them unto the end. Your Bible says, Love never faileth in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Our Bible says it, it never ceases to be. Where there's love, there's peace. The unity of, in the, of spirit in the bond of peace. The, the bond of peace. That's cohesion. That someone didn't take a chain and wrap around us. There's, there's, no, there's no padlock on there. This is, this is not cords. This is not Samson. This is internal. This is a bond of peace that holds that together. It's internal. It's a picture of fellowship. And where peace is ruling, beautiful things happen. Peace between brothers. And, and aim for that. And, and, the, and the, the brother told us this morning, make it that of your intent to have it that way. We must intend to have it that way. We must intend to gain the brother. We must intend to never divide from our brother. We must intend to, to learn to appreciate each other. We must plan for that. And there's no fellowship without light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. So what hinders my honesty? At home, all the brothers know what I'm like. I can hide that from you for a weekend. I can't hide it from them. They know what I'm like. See, we really can't participate in the life of our brother and sister until we understand them and know them. And then when we find out what that's like, we suffer with them when they're suffering. And we rejoice with them when they rejoice. Oh, about a month ago, a little less, a very, very humble brother in our congregation, a very humble national brother. They have two small, three small children. The last one just was born. I think he must be only two months old, mother, month and a half. Last little baby. So you have three small children. And, and his wife is real tall. She's taller than I am. And he's short. He's, he's, I think he's a little bit shorter than my wife. So here we have Enrique y Laura. And he was having some trouble there neurologically. And they found a spot in the front left from the left lobe of his brain. Tomorrow he's going for an MRI to see just what this spot might be. And she is suffering, she is struggling, his wife is struggling, his wife is, she can, the tears come to her eyes just if you mention anything about it. And uh, we had an anointing service for him the last thing we did on Wednesday in the evening before I left the congregation was pray for him for this assignment tomorrow morning. You and I can't take the spot away. 
you and I are not neurosurgeons. I had an interview with a neurosurgeon about the possibilities of this future problem. And we can't go in there and do that. But he's our brother. And we will not do without him. And we love him. He's going to have all the support from that congregation that he needs. He is very, very blessed. He's very thankful. He is at perfect peace. He is sure that all will be well, though he has no idea how it's going to turn out. So we suffer with him. And if we get a word that that spotting that appeared there was really something benign that's none of any problem for his development, we will all rejoice together. Fellowship ministers to the mental illnesses that are around us, the physical ailments, the spiritual losses and addictions that people have, the emotional wounds that people carry with them. Fellowship ministers to all of that. And more things beside. But our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are here to represent Christ in this earth. And people will encounter Christ when they find a, a little assembly where these principles are at work. And brothers love each other and there's no competition. And everyone is thankful. Expresses appreciation for the last person who was up front and contributed a little something or gave a testimony. Everybody participating. In our congregation, you, you, can, you, can, you can make a statement in the church service someplace and you might be needing some help and you might be try, crying as you say it. And spontaneously, some other brother or sister in the congregation might just turn around and look at you and say, but, but sister, but brother, we're, we're going to get through this together. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of this. And they don't, they don't wait for the preacher to say it. Just a few weeks ago, we had one of our sisters, a single sister in the congregation, standing in front of their church on a Wednesday night. She had made a terrible mistake in her life, and she never told anybody about it. When she was in my home a few hours prior to that, she told me why she had never told anybody about that. It was partly our fault, because she was afraid to say it. But, but, but now she wants to say it. And she knows she needs to say it. And she never had a boyfriend before. And 29 years old. Just started visiting a young man from the States who speaks another language from what she does. So I asked her if we make these plans like this, would this be okay? Do you think you'd feel okay with that? Yes, yes, Brother Dale, we'll do that like that. So that's okay, you come front. I'm going to stand beside you. Then I'm going to ask your friend to come and stand on this side of you. And, and then with us there supporting you, you just tell the congregation what you have in mind. And that poor sister poured out the story of her failure. And I ask a sister back here to speak to our this dear soul and give her some words of direction and help and comfort. And I ask a brother to stand up and speak to her. And then when I was done, they were able to sit down. And I said, if anyone else has anything they'd like to say, you may, stand, you may say it. And a single brother stood up. And of course, he was speaking another language. But I'll try to put it in your words because your culture is different, you might not get this illustration. But in our culture, we call a bill for things that you bought and things you must pay, we call that a factura. So you said we have this factura, we have this bill, we have this invoice. I think that's your word for it. And it's someone who's an authority, it's someone who have the, who have the right and the power to collect that bill, writes across there, puts a big stamp across there, puts his instruments that says, Nulo. 
Void. Canceled. He said, sister, there's no factura. There is no invoice. It's all gone. It was a beautiful time there. When I was happening, I guess it made it a little easier after that. When another brother then, a few services later, do you want to speak with all the brothers on a Wednesday evening? He opened up his life and talked about a serious entrapment that has controlled his life ever since he was a small boy. And got married with this addiction hanging into his life trying to live the Christian life with his addiction hanging on to him through all the, through these years. And now he has been in our congregation for two years and he didn't want to hide it from anybody. He wanted them to know. And one of our national brothers looked at him when he was finished and said, Brother, for all those years, you were fighting against that. Brother, if you were fighting, you're not yet defeated. You were fighting. And now the rest of us join to help you fight that. We work with people who have serious emotional problems. Part of our ministry has to do with keeping correspondence with quite a few people, even here in the States, that are in trouble with their parents, trouble with deep issues in their own lives, having trouble fitting into churches. And so it was that a young lady, after about a year of correspondence, I suggested she come to Costa Rica and visit us. Serious emotional problems. The kind of thing that is very close to a very dangerous edge where she was living. There for a couple of days and and we were very, very busy over that time, and, and, and my wife and I felt we were not doing very effective work in trying to minister to her alone. And so the second to last day that she was there, my wife said, Brother Dale is real sorry that he has not had much time with you. We, have, we don't feel like we've done you much good. You're worth far, far more than we're able to do for you here. And here was the answer. Encountering Christ... The Fellowship of the Saints. She said, Oh no, Suzanne. No, no, it's not like that at all. I have never seen a church like this in my life. I've never experienced anything like this ever. Just being here is healing to me. Just being here gives me hope. Just being here, things I've seen in the Bible, I know it's a reality. I'm going home different from when I came because of what I found I was here. It was just some national brothers and sisters, first generation Christians, who meet together with Christ in the midst. It's hard to be among them without sensing. That some another life and hope are present. And we all can leave the service and go out and live it until we gather together again. I have one more thing to say. To bring this kind of life and vitality to your congregation. You must be like that brother that you heard about this morning who said, of all people that I know, I knew none as well as I know Jesus Christ. And make him the object of your worship. And make the intention to live as he lives as nearly as you can. And give him the opportunity to, to wash out of your life and purge you of anything that would mar that image. So that when you have a collection of brothers and sisters, a group of committed brothers and sisters gathering together, with that image and that stature growing up into the perfect fullness of God, there's nothing to hinder the image of Christ in your local assembly. We must be like Christ. 
A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. No man hath greater love than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I commanded you. If we could leave this assembly with that in our hearts, leave this assembly with that desire within us. Go back to our home congregations with intent to put this to work there in that body. Then heaven will echo with the results of Kingdom Fellowship 2017. If there's someone here this morning that feels that blockage with God, that prideful hindrance and rejection and rebellion against the Lordship of Jesus. If there's someone here that is not experiencing the intimacy and the sweetness of a broken life, a yielded life, a sacrificed life, a living testimony, and there's something hindering that work, it's hindering your church. And I would recommend that we fall on our knees and call upon the name of the Lord and receive the help we need before we leave this assembly today. I want to thank you for your patience, for listening to these few words. But the encounter with Christ happens because Christ is at home and free to live here. And he makes his habitation here. And the people that know us and come among us can see it. And needs can be met. And what Christ did is still being done in some place of the world, some place somewhere. Christ is very active and very involved in interceding for all these needs and has us here to do a task that he left for us throughout all the world. May God bless you this afternoon.